Brother Aaron will be speaking from 1 Kings 8.56. Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. I know that it's common for us to notice how our meetings are tailored to fit well together and what the brethren prepare and bring on a regular basis. This is on a regular basis. But I am thankful for the way that we have one topic that we can focus on together. We, we all plow in the same field, generally in the kingdom as it were, but whenever we have one particular aspect, it's like the Lord is gathering all the workers to one area where he wants us to labor together so that he can divulge himself more in these particular things to the body all at once. And so I'm thankful that the Lord has allowed us to see these things and that it's not an environment of competition. Oh, they said what I was going to say. Now I'm going to cross it out of my notes. I've heard people say things like that. But it's a confirmation that what the Lord has for the body, we're all partaking of and we all join in together. So I'm very thankful for this focus of God's immutable counsel. And today, Brother Aaron's topic is, there hath not failed one word of his good promise. This is when Solomon was dedicating the temple, and he said this at the culmination of these things, as they watched the hand of the Lord having worked up to this point, and not one thing had failed. Now, when we think of the promise of God, we think of what he's told us that he'll do. Brother Michael referred to this. He's revealed something to us and promised that it will come. It's his way of communicating his will to his people. If it were not spoken, it would be more of an intention, which God does have. But when he speaks it to his people in a promise, he engages the hearts of his people to expect him working his will along with him. These are great and precious promises, the scripture tells us. They're precious to his people because we have something from the Lord that he's given us that he's promised to fulfill. So we hold on to it as precious. But think about it from the Lord's perspective. He has invested himself in giving this to us. They are precious to the Lord, these precious promises that he's entrusted to his people. He's disclosing his will and his desire to his men, his people. He's giving himself in the promise. So he has invested a great deal. He's given us something precious in each promise. Now these, this scripture refers to his good promise, yeah. the good promise. Blessed is the man that is convinced that the promise of God is good. This shows that there is agreement between the one who's received the promise and the one who's given the promise. A desire, a shared desire for him to accomplish everything that he's spoken of in that promise. When we are convinced that the promise is good, then we will trust every one that he makes. Even if we don't fully understand all of the intricate workings or implications of it at the time, we will trust if we know that it is a good promise. <clears throat> the promise is God, of God is good because his word is good. He speaks the promise. And his word is good because we know he himself is good. Amen. His promise is good because it's proven and it's sure. And it affects good in the ones to whom he gives the promise. By his promise, he re reveals his purpose and his desire, and we can learn of his character in meditating and thinking about, upon these promises. We can learn aspects of God himself. Now Solomon said there is not one word failed of this good promise, not one word, not one detail. We want to see that the Lord is very detailed in giving these promises. You remember as he gave the promise to Abraham, he started with the seed, and then as time went by, he revealed something more that had to do with the promise he gave, another detail. Time went by, he gives another detail to the promise that he gave. He's very detailed, and it's because his plan, his purpose is very detailed. That's why his promises are as well. Um, the Lord has an intention with every word 
that he speaks. The, the scriptures say that not one word will return to him void without having accomplished that for which he sent it. That's what these details and these promises are. They're intentions for accomplishing something specific in the people, in the earth, and in his purpose. So because God's promises are very detailed, I wanted to encourage us to become familiar with every word, every detail of the promise. So that when these small, what we would consider small things come to pass, we can see that was a detail. And the Lord's bringing that to pass. As he's bringing those things to pass, it's a confirmation that when the whole has been spoken, then he's going to fulfill the whole as well. Amen. There came a time in Egypt when the money failed. There came a time later generations later when the the spirit of Egypt failed the whole the uh, the glory of Kedar failed because God judged it the, there came a time in Israel when the wine failed and also the when the labor of the olive failed there will there came a time by Jesus's words when uh, when men's hearts failed them for fear. By the confession of many men in Scripture, mine eyes failed, my refuge failed, my soul failed, my strength faileth, my flesh faileth, and his wisdom faileth. You have all tasted of failure because we're, we're of Adam. We've all firsthand tasted of failure, but all of this tasting has been from the world and from the flesh. None of us have ever tasted of any failure of the Lord, Amen. and n neither will we. At the end of Joshua's life, he made sure that as he was leaving the world, he reminded the people of these kinds of things. He said, There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord has spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. That's a good way to leave. Leave the world. And he, and he said it again. Ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. So God can give us faith to to have the spirit of, of Joshua. When the running gets hard, and it will, if you haven't experienced it yet, it will, just remember that not one promise of God has failed. And when Satan desires to sift you as wheat, and as if you are faithful to the Lord and you continue in this straight and narrow way, you will be sifted at some point and at some time and at some level. Just remember, not one word of God not one promise of God has failed, and not one will ever fail. Amen. Man's dependency on God is profound. Even those who deny him, they themselves are dependent on him. He knits every person together in the mother's womb. All of his days are in his hand, in God's hand. That is, all of your days are in God's hand. And he even determined the time and place and the bounds of your habitation. He decided all of this. He, he determined it. And even all the, all the hairs of your head are numbered by him. A man's ignorance of, these, of this truth doesn't change this truth. Man's denial of this truth doesn't change this truth. Man's dependency of God is intricate and profound. In him, the scripture says, we live and move and have our being, and we also are his offspring. A beating heart cannot be taken for granted, and flowing blood can't be taken for granted. Waking every morning from sleep can't be taken for granted, and waking up from that sleep in your right mind can't be taken for granted. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, including these things. What do you have, Paul asks, that you haven't received? 
you received it from him. Amen. This night, Jesus said in the parable, your soul will be required of thee. Then what will, whose will those things be that you have gathered up? Well, ev for every, every person that is born, there's going to come a night when your soul will be required of you. All men answer to God. Amen. They don't rule over themselves. Even though men have confessed this, you know, the Psalms have words, have, have words like this. We are, we are our own, and we, um, our, our lips are our own, and all these types of confessions. There's a lot of modern versions of those types of confessions as well. But this, this night, one day, your soul will be required of you, and it will be required by the one whom gave, who gave it to you. You cannot add one day to your life one hair to your head, or one cubit to your height. Amen. You don't even know if you're going to have tomorrow. Yes. All the while that you're worrying about it, uh -huh. it hasn't been given to you yet. Uh -huh. Life itself is on lease from God, and the terms are going to come due. Yeah. You don't know the day nor the hour when your life or where you, when your soul will be required of you. We all know that there is an end to the race, but none of us know when that end is. Nebuchadnezzar had particular trouble with this. He said things like, look at this, behold this great kingdom and all the glory of it that I have built for my sake. Well, it was taken from him. Pharaoh, he had a, he had a hard time with, with this as well. Who is the Lord that I should, should obey him? And he had to, he had to learn uh, the, hard, the hard way. Herod, he also had a, had a hard time with this. He just received all the glory to himself, and his, and his soul was, was required of him that very moment. The scripture says, the grass withers, the flower fades. How about that for a humbling comparison? That's what this whole, the Holy Spirit's comparing us to. The grass withers, and the flower, that lasts even shorter time than the grass, it fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. It's actually a sort of a miracle that a man outlasts the day. The frailty of life can be exposed by so many things, by, by disease or by disaster or by tragedy. In a moment's time, the frailty of life can be exposed and uncovered. You can meet with the frailty of life, the stark reality of the brevity of life in just a moment. A life can be ended by a germ. A life can be ended by a wind. Just a wind. A life can be ended by the careless act of another man. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. In the beginning... God breathed into him the breath of life. So not only was he formed by, by the Lord out of the dust of the earth, then he breathed into him the breath of life. And from that first breath that man received from God, every subsequent breath has been given to him by God. What is our life, James asks? What is it? Just take an inventory. What is your life? It's, it's but a vapor. It's here one moment, and it's, and it's gone the next. And Solomon even reasoned about the memory. Your, your memory can pass away just as, just as surely as your life will pass away. It's only if the Lord wills, will we live Amen. to say nothing of doing this or that. Yeah. Amen. The Lord doesn't have contingency plans, but we have to. The scripture says, don't, don't fear a man whose breath is in his nostrils. In other words, that's all he's guaranteed, is what he already has in his nostrils. So don't think too highly of yourself. And don't think too lowly of the one who gives you breath. The creation not only owes its existence to the creator, but also its subsistence. Not only does it exist because he created it, but it continues because he sustains it. Not only of the impersonal creation, but also of our own beings. Consider the rising and the setting of the sun. This is predictable because God is upholding all, he's upholding all things Amen. by the word 
of his power. Just think about everything in our, in our lives that's tied to the consistency of the rising and setting of the sun. Just consider how it would change life if you didn't know when the sun was going to come up, how long it was going to be up, or if it was going to come up, if it was going to set, where it was going to rise, if it was going to rise. <clears throat> the changing in cycles of the seasons proves that God is a faithful creator. He upholds all things by the word of his power. We should give thanks to God and his faithfulness that the sun doesn't wander away from the earth or that the earth doesn't creep closer to the sun. He's upholding all these things by the word of his power. The great foundations, we should give thanks, that rather the fountains, we should give thanks that the great fountains that broke forth into the earth in Noah's days haven't broke forth again. And they haven't because he upholds all things by the word of his power. We should give thanks to his faithfulness that the law of gravity is the same every day. It doesn't change. By the time you wake up, the law of gravity is the same when you go to bed. It hasn't, it hasn't changed to be stronger or weaker. It's consistent throughout the day. Just, just imagine what things would be like in the earth if the law of gravity was changeable and variable like men. Just imagine, what would a construction site look like if, if the laws of gravity just suddenly changed and got all, got all mixed up, to say nothing of, the, of the, the landscape of the whole world? Now, could the Lord be less faithful in the gospel than he is in the natural creation? If this is true, if the faithful, this faithfulness of God is true in that which is temporal, how much more... Is he faithful in that which is eternal? The faithfulness of God can be that is seen in this, in the, uh, the nature, in this creation. That same faithfulness is at work in salvation. He has given us in creation a tangible index into his, his faithfulness. An index that can be seen and touched and felt. And, and experienced even in these bodies. And his promises are so much more dependable than the rising and setting of the sun Amen. on which we depend. The, his promises are so much more powerful than the law of gravity, which we depend on day after day. His promises are even more constant than the lapping of the sea on the seashore, and they're greater than the highest mountain that you have ever seen. Even when people are not hoping on his promises, they are still beneficiaries of his faithfulness. Amen. And th this faithfulness will either be for you or against you in the day of judgment. And those who, were, who received of, the, of the, the benefits of the rain falling on the just and on the unjust and all the faithfulness of God that is, that is just poured out and showered out on this creation for those who didn't trust him, it will be, that will, will be a testimony against them in the, in the day of judgment. Of judgment, We are living in a world that is being upheld by his promise. Yeah. And his promise has not failed. Yeah. There simply are too many testimonies all around us for men not to trust in God. Amen. The creation itself. Now God himself does not fail. And that's why his promise does not fail. Please don't, don't separate God from his word. Men don't do this with other men. We don't separate a person from what the person communicates. His, his words are, are his words, but, but he said that. See, there's no, men don't separate the man from what he said, but they try to do this with God. Well, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure about the Bible, but I, I love God. And I'm a, well, we, you know, the, the Bible's been interpreted and, and been you know, translated, and it's been written down by men, but, but I do love God. But you, well, you can't separate God from his word. You can't have it two different ways. God's promises haven't failed because God doesn't fail. The scripture says, the, Jesus said, the scripture cannot be broken. That includes translation. That includes language. If God has a hard time preserving his word, then he... 
Then there's, there's a lot of other complications, are there not? His word, the word of the Lord, endures forever. Solomon now, <clears throat> when Solomon said this, this is after the, the big, long, glorious prayer that he gave at the dedication of the, te of the temple. It was a long prayer there in 1 first, uh, first Kings chapter 8. He, he prayed it on his, hand, on his knees with his hand stretched out to heaven. And when he got done with that, then he addressed the people in the, in the text. Uh, uh, that was uh, read just a minute ago. Now Solomon had probably been hearing about this temple, the building of this temple, his whole life. Probably, likely from a young boy. Because David, he wanted to build this temple. Uh -huh. David, Solomon's father wanted to build this temple. But the Lord had revealed to David that you're, you're not going to build it. Uh, David was so close to the Lord, it's like the, the Lord, he, he, let him, he let him enter into the work and get, by gathering materials. So there were cedars. Cedar trees, you know, gathered the lumbers made of the trees and, and probably lots of other material. Because David was a very industrious, um, fruitful, and productive man. But now after all of these years that Solomon had been hearing and probably seeing things, seeing activity take place surrounding this temple, now it's done. Now it's done. Now it's complete. It was David's desire... To build it, but it was Solomon's work to build it. Yeah. And it was promised to his father. So you see how when, when Solomon said, Solomon, this is not just like an outside observation. Oh, look, this is, not what, this is not how Solomon's saying. He said it was promised to his father, and his father put his hand to the work so much as he was allowed to do. And Solomon, he completed the work, and now Solomon says, not one promise has failed yeah. of all the, all the good promises that he and now he also promised, God promised to David that he would not suffer a man to, to sit on his throne. See, so there, there's a lot going on, a lot of thoughts, a lot of associations in Solomon's mind about, and he even, he even says, which he promised to Moses. And so David, Solomon's not only talking about the temple. He's, he's talking about what the Lord has promised to his people on a, on a very grand scale. God has written himself up. In the scriptures. Is it, the, the Bible is like a self-commentary of God from God. God has written himself up. And two very big things, themes in this commentary is God is able and God is faithful. God is able and God is faithful. Now, as the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses is, is a word confirmed. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, it is confirmed. Well, we have more than two or three witnesses in the scripture that God is able and that God is faithful. God has demonstrated. He's not, only, he's not only said that he is able, and he's not only said that he is faithful, but he has demonstrated that he is able and faithful. And I commend to you, brethren, that God, in doing so, God is helping us to believe. Amen. He's helping us to believe. Amen. It's like God has gone above and beyond in not only telling us, but also demonstrating us to us. Now, he has demonstrated that nature poses no restraint on what he has determined to do. He actually created nature as an instrument of demonstration, of, of his purpose, of, of his will. It's like, you know, we've, we've mentioned so many times, like you, you can see uh, glimpses and shadows of newness of life, you know, in, in, the, in, in this creation, and, and fruitfulness, where Jesus used this, uh, this creation as like examples and an index. He says, that make, the, make the tree good and the fruit will be good. You know? And if the, if the fruit is bad, you know, it's, the, it's the problem with the roots. You know? And he, he used, consider the birds. He used this creation as a, it, it, I like to think of it in this way, that when God created this world, what he was really thinking about is redemption. And that's why so, so much of redemption can be seen in the creation. He created this world for redemption. For the gospel. He, in fact, the scripture says all things were made by him and for him. So na nature poses no restraint on him. The, the same storm <clears throat> that the apostles thought that they were going to die in is the storm that Jesus walked on. Yeah. It, doesn't pose, it doesn't pose any restraint on him. It actually is, it, it, 
it is it's the platform of demonstration for God to show that he is able and that he is faithful. He actually picked Abraham and Sarah because they were, they, they were, they were barren, not only because they were barren. He picked them, and he, on purpose, he waited until they were past the age of, of bearing. God is here in, not, in Abraham and Sarah. He's not here just doing the best that he can, kind of like, you know, you got to work with what you got because we're men. But this is not, no, God is creating what he's going to work with in Abraham and in Sarah. He created this impossibility so that he could do the impossible to demonstrate that he's able and that he's faithful. The Lord would reveal hundreds of years before uh, Mary was found with child that a virgin would conceive. He, see, the Lord orchestrated this, these things together. Hundreds of years before the virgin conceived, you have Abraham and Sarah. Beyond the, day, beyond the time of bearing, they're bearing children. And so Abraham and Sarah see as like a testimony of, well, look what, Ab look what the Lord did in Abraham and Sarah. So then later on you get this word of a virgin shall, con shall conceive. Men should think about what God's already done with conception. Passing of time does not add hardship to the Lord's ability and his faithfulness. It does on men, but it doesn't on the Lord. You know, it was 14 days between the time that the angel appeared to Paul on the ship and the time that that ship actually saw land. And, the, and Paul stood up and, and he said, I believe God and that it's going to turn out even as it was, it was revealed to me. And 13 days later, still nothing had changed. See, that was, that was like, a, that was like a, a custom demonstration of the Lord is able and the Lord is faithful. What about the, the case of Lazarus? He, he waited four days. Yeah. And, the, and it was said, you know, if you had been here, my brother uh, would, would not have died. But it's like the Lord waited four days so that there's no mistake. Yeah. Lazarus is dead. Yeah. He's already in the tomb. Yeah. And this is a custom situation designed to show that he is able and that he is faithful. <clears throat> men always think in terms of power, men always think of removing all enemies, but the Lord hasn't done this. With regards to immutable counsel and uncontested power, then men would just eliminate all the opposition before they do what they've purposed to do, but God hasn't hasn't done this. God not only leaves the devil in the world where he's working out salvation, he not only gives him a work, he not only leaves him there to work and to cause trouble in the domain in which God is working out redemption, but he even thwarts the efforts of the devil and turns his efforts into his instruments of purpose. And so see, Satan, he saw uh, an opportunity to go at Job and to take all that he has and even to touch his flesh and look what that occasion has turned out. Yeah, yeah. Look at what that occasion of Job has turned into. Mm -hmm. Even people who, who have no love for the truth and no testimony, they still say things like, he has the patience of Job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. See, what Satan, what Satan, what he thought he was doing, see, it was, turned, it was turned against him. Just like Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God would take it and just, he'll just turn it, turn it around. The same is uh, the case with, Peter, with Paul's thorn. It was, a, it was sent to him by a, a, a minister of the devil. And look what it taught Paul. See, Satan, he probably thought here's an open door of opportunity to... To, uh, to enter in and to, to cause some disruption, and, to, and, he, and he did it, and then it, it just proved out that God, he usurped what the devil did. Yeah. To demonstrate, what about Cedar's, Peter's uh, sifting? What about it? He was, Satan desired to sift him, but it got, it got turned around. So the, the enemy, he knew what God had promised. He was one of the three that heard that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. And even though he knew, he couldn't thwart the fulfillment. Amen. 
Every time he had the opportunity to assert himself and to cause disruption and to cause trouble, he did it. But it was always turned around against what he intended to do. Amen. It's like God allowed the enemy to get, he allows the enemy to get some traction yeah. only to turn the traction around against to what he, what he intended right. for, for it to happen. And all of this is to show that he is able and that he is faithful. The presence of evil and the presence of injustice does not mean that God has lost control of the creation. He, God is not scrambling to maintain control. He's not uh, trying to, to recover his, his efforts. That Judas betrayed Jesus was not a divine malfunction. That one generation died in the wilderness does not mean that God failed. That the, pro that the, land, the promised land was full of enemies, enemy nations, it was not a hitch in the plans. Nothing had to be, there was no regrouping in, in the heavenly places. Oh, what are we going to do now? God has demonstrated that he's able and that he is faithful. I like the words of Jeremiah. He said more than once, nothing is too difficult for thee. Because he Amen. saw it. God's demonstrated it. Nothing Amen. is too difficult for thee. In fact, I like how Je the reason Jesus told, he told the disciples several times about his suffering, about his, cru his crucifixion, about his resurrection, several different times and occasions, and it just wasn't, just wasn't sinking in. You know, they didn't understand. And one time Peter said, no, this, this is never going to happen. And they just didn't get it or, maybe, or they didn't say anything. And Jesus at one point, he said, I've told you these things beforehand. So when it comes to pass, you'll believe. That's why God makes promises. He makes these promises ahead. It's like his promises are running out in front of him as, as like ambassadors to make these things known. Nothing is too difficult for thee. I wanted to say a few more words about the, about the temple, the, the, the completion of the temple, because God, this is where this, the, the, these words of Solomon were spoken, at the dedication of the temple. This is not a structure that was built for any man's name. There were other structures like at Babel that was built for to make a name for themselves. Or in um, Babylon, where Nebuchad everything Nebuchadnezzar built was for is for his own sake. It was for for his own name. This is a structure that was built for God. Yeah. And so at this dedication, nobody was thinking about men. Everybody was thinking about God. It was a structure that God came down and filled with his presence. It was a structure dedicated to God for the service of God, to the will of God. Everything in this temple had to do with God. Yeah. It wasn't a place for men to do what they wanted to do. It was a place for men to do what God wanted men to do. It was a place invested with the will of God, the purpose of God, the presence of God, the, the purpose of God. God was being extolled at this time when the temple was being dedicated. The people were conscious of God, not of men. And at this time, Solomon says, not one word of all of his good promise has, has failed. I, I surmise that Solomon had quite an attentive audience when he said this. Not one word has, has failed. In fact, this was the fulfillment not of David's dreams, God said, I will build you a house. Amen. This is not just God letting, letting David do what he wants. God said, I will build thee a house. And he went on to say, I will establish thy kingdom forever. The kingdom of David is still established. In fact, the Lord, he promised that, the, it come, that Jesus would come from the root and offspring of David. <clears throat> the temple was the tabernacle converted to a permanent structure. Now you think about the, the tabernacle, it, was, it had the outer court and the holy place and the most holy. And the temple, it had an outer court and a holy place and the, and the most holy. But the, te the temple was the, the, the model of the tabernacle made permanent. And see, this is, the way, this is the way the kingdom works. Is there's always a progression in the kingdom. The light always gets brighter in the kingdom. The revelation always gets greater in the kingdom. Amen. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And so the establishment of this temple was like an example of the, of the way of, the, of God's kingdom. 
It's being made permanent. It's being made bigger, grander, more, uh, more impressive. Everything in the temple was about God. It was about coming before God, meeting with God, making an offering to God, being forgiven by God. All, all, everything in the temple was about God. It was about holiness. It was about purity. It was about righteousness. It was about cleanness. You came, when you, as you approached the temple, you were forced to think about being clean because there was a labor. There was a labor of washing. You were forced to think about an offering because there was an altar. You were forced to think about sacrifice because that altar was about blood. You were, everything in, the temp, in this temple was about God. See, salvation works on promises. Mm -hmm. Salvation is like part of the found, or promises are like part of the foundation mm -hmm. of salvation. In fact, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 8 that the new covenant has been established on better promises. Mm -hmm. Now, the old covenant had promises, but the new covenant is, they're better. Good. They're Amen. better. Amen. The, the new covenant doesn't just pr make promises about your cattle and about your house and about your labor. But it's established on better promises. That is, if you take the promises out of this new covenant, what do you have left? The covenant doesn't work. It's established on promises. Now, no one could come, no one could enter into this old, into the old covenant without being a Jew, right? This was this was a a principle of the of the covenant. Now, there were allowances for a Gentile to become a Jew and to partake of the covenant. But it couldn't be done outside of that allowance, outside of that provision. There was, there was, there was a certain protocol. See, it had, this is the way it works. You don't do things how you want and another man do, do, the, do it the way he wants. This is the way God established the covenant. It wasn't a... Uh, uh, it, it wasn't the result of negotiations between God and Israel. Now, what, what do you think about the law and, the, and the, the, the tabernacle? It was God established it. And God has established this new covenant. He's established it on promises. And so just like in the old, you've got to be a Jew. One way or another, you've got to be a Jew to partake of the, prom, of the covenant. Well, now you've got to have the promise to partake of the covenant. You not, you're not going to get in this new covenant without a promise. It's established on promises. See, a democratic government works on the vote of the people. That's, it's established on voting. That's, that's how a democracy is established, is on voting. A financial business works on interest. That's what makes it, that's what makes it go, is earning interest. A, 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 an electrical motor works on current. That's what, that's what makes it move. That's what makes it productive that's the that's the design the design of the motor is is seen in when electrical current is applied it's it's established the design is established well the, see the new covenant is established on promises you take the promises out you don't have a working covenant there's always a foundation under the house and there's always there's there's promises under this new covenant the new covenant is built on promises. I don't know how I could possibly partake of this new covenant without having a promise. Amen. Amen. What premise would there be? That's right. Amen. What point of entrance is there for me to partake of this new covenant that was ratified in the blood of Christ without a promise, without my knowledge of a promise, without my hearing of the promise, without me believing in the promise, without me wanting the promise? It's built on promises. This is how the covenant works. Amen. <clears throat> Just think about this. Whosoever will may come. That's the promise. Now, who wants to come without a promise making him want to come? Whoever wanted to come to Jesus without a promise? Consider it this way. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. If any man thirst, that's your qualification. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So who has any thirst for what Jesus has who has never heard a promise? Who wants what Jesus has? Who has ever desired what Jesus gives without 
First, hearing a promise. The, the covenant is established on, on promises. Have, have you ever heard anyone express a, a deep, undeniable, unavoidable desire for something, but they don't know what it is? I just, I really, I'm giving my life for this, to get this. Well, what is it? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I, I want it more than anything. See, there has to, there's some sort of interface. For there to be a real desire, there's some experience in what is desired. See, that's what the promise does. The promise whets the appetite. The, the promise is what, the new covenant is established on promises. Everybody that makes it to heaven will want to. There's, <laughs> all the works of God follow a promise of God. All of the works of God follow a promise of God. That is, God promises before he does. He always has. As the works of God draw closer, his works cast a shadow forward. And that shadow that goes forward is a promise. You all, we always see his work coming before it comes in the form of a promise. Think about Anna. <clears throat> After she had seen, you know, the uh, eight days old, the baby Jesus was brought, and Simeon took, took the child up and said, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Anna sees it. And she goes and tells everyone who is in Jerusalem, who is waiting for redemption. Yeah. Yeah. What were they waiting for? How were they waiting? What did they know to wait for? How did they know to wait? What were they looking for? It was the promise. They were a promise people. They were, they were looking because there was a promise. They were waiting because there was a promise. And Anna knew who to go talk to, who to look for. Well, according to Peter, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. Nobody be looking unless God promised it. We look for a new heavens and a new earth according to his promise. All, see, all of our desires towards God result from the promises of God. They all result from his new, this covenant is established on promises. Now, in Egypt, as the time of the promise grew nigh, then the people multiplied. See, there's a, there's, it's like there's a, rump, there's a stirring in the grass. There's a, there's a, there's a rumbling that is caused by, by the promise. What would the scriptures be if you took all the promises out? What would you have left? How would, the, how would the gospel work to draw men and to call men if God still did all the same things that he promised to do, but he just never made the promise? How would the gospel work? Consider, here's some details. Jesus was born just like he was always going to be, but he was never promised. That promise back in Genesis of the seed of the woman was never made. That occasion of, of Isaac and uh, Abraham and Isaac going up, God will provide himself a lamb. That never happened. Yeah. Mm. And the promise to David, you'll never suffer a man. That was never given. Yeah. And the word of Isaiah, uh, a virgin shall conceive. That was, that was never given. And Jeremiah's word, a righteous branch. And Malachi's word, a son of righteousness with healing in his wings. None of those were ever given, but Jesus was still born. How would it be different? What about Jesus died, but there, Jesus still died, but there was never a promise given about his death. Now, think about the Jesus, Jesus still died like he did, but there was no Levitical system. There was no sacrificial system that went before. See, these were all like promises. They were all, they were all teaching. They were all revealing. They were all like a light shining, shining ahead. That's what the promises do. Now, see, when men do a work, they'll take a survey first. When men do a work, they, they'll, do some, they'll do some marketing, like, you know, testing the waters. And before, before men do the work, they're going to they're gonna take a poll. They've got to have some data to go on, you know. And, and then they decide what to do. But God, God promises first, and then he does it. That's how, that's how God works. A promise catches the attention. It's an incentive. It's a, it's a revealing incentive. The promise of God is a revealer, and it's an incentive. It makes people look 
People are looking like those people that Anna went and reported to. Their people are looking because God promised. It, and it also calls for men to wait for God to do what he promised to do. I don't think Abraham was still entertaining, or Abram. I don't think Abram was entertaining any more hopes of having children at 75 years old. I think those things have, that, that hope and those thoughts and those, uh, those um, desires, those, those, that waiting had probably been put aside some time ago. I don't think Sarah... Or Sarah likely in her old age had already resolved herself to be childish, childless. And then the promise came. Yeah. Amen. Then the promise came. And now their thoughts changed. Amen. In you, in thy seed. But they were old and they were childish. See how the promise, it's like God, he, he injects the promise into nature. He in, he. He imposes, it's like the promise imposes itself into the world and into the, into the men. The promise of God changes things. It changed how Abraham and Sarah thought. It changed their expectations. It intruded. It actually intruded into nature and did what nature couldn't do. See, God is seen and known in his promises. I will. I will. God is made known in his promises. And it is knowing God that is eternal life. Amen. So it is not possible to know God outside of what God has promised. That's right. Now men fell so far and salvation is so high that the promises are like an introduction to God. It's like an orientation. I've already mentioned this a little bit. <clears throat> But man, men have to be, in, in coming to God and being brought to God and being reconciled to God, men have to be oriented uh, to God. Think about what he has promised. He, will, he that overcometh, he'll sit down with me in, in my throne. Yeah. You see, that, that's a place we've got to be prepared. Yeah. Men have to be prepared to sit down with him in a place of, of power and of rule and of authority. We've got to be made, we've got to be made ready for that. See, that's what the promise is doing. He, that he pro do you want does, does this promise have any any pull in your heart? Does it have any drawing quality to it? He'll he'll sit down with me in my throne. See that draw is actually preparing you to receive the promise. Amen. Be thou over ten cities. Yeah. You you, you got to be a person has to be made ready to be thou over ten cities. What about that great banquet, the, 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 uh, the feast, uh, the wedding supper of the Lamb, where you'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Have you ever found yourself reading about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and the prophets, and you, you, you felt a desire for these men yeah. or, or these women of faith, Sarah and Esther and, um, and Mary and Elizabeth? You, you found a desire to, to be, you're going to sit down with these people. You're going to sit down at a table with these people. And it's the promise that makes you ready. Yes. Makes you ready to receive it. Even with all the promises and all these types and all these shadows, all these forerunners, it is still with great difficulty that we see and perceive that which has not yet been fulfilled. Just imagine, with, just imagine the task of seeing these things without the promise. Or wanting these things without the promise. Well, <clears throat> I, I commend these things to you that the, the, word, the word of promise is, is they're, very, they're a very merciful and a very grace, gracious gesture from God to men. Amen. That he has what the very thing that we need and require, he, he's promised it. Amen. The very thing that we must have and must want in order to be saved, he's, he's promised it to us. He's, he's arranged things just like Brother Fred was wont to say. It's so perfectly adapted to our situations. And so I'll leave you with just a, a few thoughts here. That the, the promises are like the, crown, the, the, uh, the town crier of the old days. Run through the streets, making the news known. <laughs> the promises are, are they're declaring. Amen. They're, they're making known. It's like an ambassador representing the homeland of the king Amen. in a country afar off. Or like the seer of old time that made known what was coming 
And so I exhort you, brethren, to believe the promises, love the promises, and desire the promises of God. For not one word has or will fail.